So for those of you who were able to attend Al's church demo, he did a couple different things for us, but one of the things we'd asked him to do was to demonstrate his squared around little, little decorative bowls where he carved the rims. Um, and he has various different patterns that he used, so I'm not quite sure why he used a maple blank. Did we not have a cherry blank for him that day or something? But he used maple. But to get the coppery look that he's known for, he starts with a cherry. Um, so a dry blank, something like this. And he showed us how he comes in and gets, the, you know, the finish and all of that. But I wasn't going to do any of the turning. I was just going to show you the finishing since that was our theme today. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just note that he uses a, a slightly curved uh, shear scraper and he just touches it a little bit to get that little texture under there and and I think he used the same thing to get these beads. I wanted a little bit bigger bead look so I used a very, um, I used a small bowl gouge with a very swept back point to it so I could actually use it almost as a detail spindle gouge. Um, and there was a little bit of tear out, but I didn't worry too much about the tear out because I actually think it adds some character to the finish. I did sand um, some 220. I tried to get you know in the beads a little bit to clean that up a little, but not much. Um, ended up with a, a uh, I think a 220 sanded flat surface. Um, and then before he carves, he draws a series of radial lines just to give him some direction, and then on the lathe he puts a series of, of circles on there. Um, and he's not necessarily trying to follow those exactly. Um, he's, he's quite freehand with the carving and trying to be very random, but you try to get that sense of the pattern flowing out from the center and circling around. Um, he, he was actually selling some of these tips. Um, they are triangular uh, tip just to be meant to use on either the Fordham or the Dremel tool. Um, they're not nearly as uh, precise, perhaps, as some of the things that you're using when you're carving. Well, you know that guy uh, is sick, and he, uh, he he's not making them anymore. So that I think these were some of the last ones that yeah. Al had yeah. to sell. But I did just see an ad for him in did you? one of the papers. So I don't know if someone else is making them now. Well, three of us were out with Al Sturt uh, back in the, in the early spring, and uh, he, and he said that guy anymore, was sick. Right? No, yeah. I got him. Guy advertises in um, wood turning or yeah, yeah one of those uh, yeah A A W magazine yeah. that's where I saw that yeah, yeah. And, uh, so I think maybe there are some available but it yeah. takes him like you order them and it yeah. takes like four months before he makes them oh okay there's two different there's at least two different styles so this one is, is basically rounded over and, and gives you the round edge I added another one that was squared which was a similar pattern except every other would be a square end. And then this one, each tip is a different height. So as you use it, it gives you three different lines. That's what's on here. <laughs> Same as this pattern he's done here, although his must have been a little wider than this one, because these are a little further apart. Um, I came back in just the other day, did a little with this tip, and you can see how they're a little bit closer together than, than these are. All right. So I was just going to demo a little bit, and then you know, when we're done today, if anybody wants to just try it, more than welcome to try it out. But he doesn't, it's, it's nothing fancy. Uh, he does have, in his shop, he has a, a, a vacuum hold down system. But I basically just hold it. The, the one difficult thing is you have to be at a little bit of an angle unless you're off the wood. Um, and I, I get the sense, and Mike, you can probably confirm this, that higher speed, this is a variable speed, so the higher speed gives you a little bit cleaner cut, and you're going to get a much cleaner cut when you're going with the grain than when you're going across the grain. But you'll do it in a small section at a time, and just, just touch it here and there at random, using those lines just as a guide for about what angle. And if they overlap, it's okay. But he's trying to get about the same density everywhere. That's the main thing. And then it'll come out, he'll do the, the round part. And, and he really does it quite speedily. Just zip it away. And you can get, you can start to work too far over in the same angle. You gotta, you gotta do a little bit at a time, and then you can change your angle. And I can see I'm a little less dense here than I am here, so I'd come back and do a little bit more. 
Maybe I needed a few more going this way. I'm just looking to fill in any holes. And when you're happy with it, you're trying to have a pretty gentle touch or you can, you can go in, particularly towards the edge. You can grab the edge. Um, the one thing he does is he likes to put uh, a decisive bead or, or edge when he does his carving <laughs> that defines where the carving is going to take place. So I did the same thing on the rim here, creating two beads that give you a distinct edge and then you carve inside of that. Um, I did one um, before where I didn't do that and every once in a while I'd get to the top and I'd carve in too much. I think I have one here that went beyond the edge, but trying to, trying to keep them um, with a border. All right, so he'll do that all the way around. Um, and then uh, he, he might sand it a little bit. Um, either he, he likes to use the Scotch Bright pads, the green ones are the rougher ones. Um, and you can do this on the lathe, except you can't really get to the wings, so you gotta always do the wings a little bit. And he's just trying to get rid of the worst of the fluff or tear out. Um, I'm a little lazy and I don't like to take as long, so I'll, I'll just come in with a little 320 and do that. And you don't care about the color of the wood, you don't care about the pencil lines, because you're going to end up painting over all of that. But he's just trying to get out some of that fluff, and that probably is enough. I actually find that a little bit of the tear out, again, adds some real character when you, when you do your final buffing. Um, he takes the black milk paint, and he recommends the old-fashioned milk paint as opposed to the, what is it, real milk paint is the other company. Um, this does not need a bonding agent, and the other one you're supposed to do a bonding agent in it, so I don't know. They come in lots of um, sort of old-fashioned colors, like this is a pewter, basically, but I still tend to mix them. The green that I have is a little too green for me. This is about half green and half pewter, um, but the black, he mixes it very runny, you know, very like ink-like almost. Um, you mix it with water, warm water will help it dissolve faster, and then you let it sit for half an hour or something just to make sure it's all dissolved, and then you mix it up some more. And then he said, you know, he'll, he'll usually mix it in a plastic bottle with a cap you can put on. I just use these cups. Um, and he said it's got a shelf life of a couple of days. You can put it in the refrigerator and maybe a couple more days. But you want to mix up about what you're going to use. And, and it goes a long way. Of course, I mixed up about ten times more than I needed. Um, and he just uses these cheapo brushes. He doesn't really care about whether it gives you a good, you know, and just dabs it all on there. And it'll be thin enough that you can see through it a little. Uh, you can see this was what he did the day that, that we were working. And it might have been a little bit thicker than on what I'm using here. Um, and it'll, it, as I was reading online, um, about milk paint finishes and everybody says the first coat you put on it always just kind of looks like crap because it's got bubbles in it it's got undissolved bits of the powder in there um, it'll have brush strokes in it and the fact is none of that matters <laughs> just don't worry too much about it um, let it dry you can either let it dry overnight or put it out in the sun it'll dry in about an hour and, and it dries to a very flat finish all right um, let me put it on some cherry here, just so you can see how, how thin this is. So how many coats? Uh, just one coat of the black. All right. The reason he puts the black on is because it reacts with the cherry to give you that copper look when you're done. So you can see how that's, that's quite thin on there. He might have gone a little bit thicker, but I, that's what I did on this one. Mm -hmm. So cherry is the key here for the... If you want that coppery look, the key is to start with cherry. Okay. All right. You know, Heartwood cherry, not the salad. Um, let that dry and then pick whatever color you want. And I haven't tried it yet, but I really am interested in going green and then the blue. But uh, here's some blue that I put on there. I'll just show you some green for comparison. And, and it'll also show you the color that was before I put the final finish on it. Obviously, take your air compressor and blow off. And you got to work it in. You want to make sure it gets in there. And you'll be worried that it's filling some of those carvings and almost flattening it out. Um, it, when it dries, it dries pretty flat. So again, don't worry too much about how perfect it is. And if you have, I'll try to get somewhere where it's... If you have a spot that isn't quite covered, when it dries, you can come back and put a second coat on. 
You do want to try to cover all the black. And you know, you can try to make sure all your brush strokes go round or straight, but it really won't matter because you're going to sand all that off. All right, so you do something like that. Let that dry. I let that I like to let that dry completely. So, you know, overnight and then all he uses to buff it is the scotch Brite pads. Um, and again, you can, do, you can do it on the lathe because it's nice and quick, but you, you really can't get any pressure on the wings. You know, as they're spinning around, if you put any pressure on there, you're going to start to go past them and either lose the, this will get pulled out of your hand, you don't get a good bruise on your finger. So, you know, I would come out to here on the lathe, and then I'd stop the lathe and I'd just buff. Um, again, if you want to do it more quickly, um, 320 seemed to be about right. And you're trying to sand through. Now, obviously, you can sand too much. So I'd sand about that much. And again, this isn't cherry underneath, but you can see it start to show through. And then I come in, and this will give you a little bit glossier finish. It doesn't really matter what direction you go, I don't think. And then you can decide, well, you know, do I want to do it fairly evenly or do I want to put a little extra there and maybe a little extra up there? Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to get the bottom pretty to look like it was worn, so I did a little extra on there. Um, you really just try, he, he's not trying necessarily to get a uniform look. He's trying to get something that looks fairly random. But if you buff too far, do I have any on this one? I think I did a better job on this one. I think this one has some. Yeah, if you start to buff too far, you get through the black staining mm -hmm. and you get down to raw cherry. <clears throat> and that doesn't give you that coppery look. So the key is to try to avoid going too far with it. You know, I think I've pushed the limits right in through here. Um, and you can start to see, you don't see much here, but you can start to see the grain pattern a little bit. Um, not as much on that as you can on this. I actually was considering doing even more um, to get more of that grain pattern. But you can see this, this was a very flat and uneven surface, lots of bumps, lots of um, bubbles in the paint. Uh, I actually was rushing to do this paint it just, uh, I think I did this yesterday morning. So I didn't let the paint sit long enough and it was, it was pretty uneven. Um, but then once you buff it, I did this on the lathe, um, you get a, a, a nice sort of low, low, luster to it. So there's no other finish than the milk paint. So, so this one, once it was done, and I'm trying to let that dry, if that, I don't know if it'll dry completely, but you can see it start to dry a very light green. Um, I then wanted to put something as a, a fixative. So I sprayed this one with the, um, the lacquer. Uh, I did one before where I sprayed it with shellac, and I think they look about the same, to be honest with you. But it will it will darken the paint considerably and give you a little bit of a shiny finish. So that may or may not be what you're looking for. What I was doing here was I like this matte finish and the lighter blue, particularly where you can see a little bit of the grain pattern. So I don't want to spray that one with the same thing. I don't want that glossy finish. I don't want to darken the paint as much. So I tried, I tried, I just quickly threw some paint on, buffed it down. Um, this one has the spray shellac, one, one pretty thick coat actually. Um, this one has the salad bowl finish that we were talking about. Uh, this one has the wipe on poly, one thin coat of the um, satin finish, I think. And this one has the VersaWax, the micro crystalline <laughs> wax on it. Um, and you can see the wax probably darkened it the most. This darkened it quite a bit, which highlights the copper look but I wanted it to stay more matte. So of these four, I would, I would lean towards the poly the most. <laughs> but I'm wondering if anyone else has ideas of what to put on. You, this is just the, the paint and then um, buffed back. But I don't know if that's gonna be a, a durable enough finish. Um, you know, a drop of oil on there will soak in and give you an oil spot. Um, so I'm looking for something to seal it. <coughs> is it milk paint like impossible to get off? Because of the protein when it solidifies, um, it's the whole basis of the thing. I don't know. I mean, I think it does have a good bond, but yeah. I do know that it's very easily stained. You know, oh. like if you put a little drop of oil on that, it's going to yeah. sink into it and stain it. 
Uh, real milk paint, they have a whole um, explanation on their website, and they want you to put on their shellac, I think it is. Uh, who was telling me that they've used that, and it darkens it quite a bit. Um, it would be much like this, you know, so that's going to be more of a permanent finish, mm -hmm. but I don't really like that glossy, dark color to it. Um, so, you know, and I think this is always a good idea is to try things out before you do it on the piece you like, um, try it out <coughs> in a few different samples. Yeah, I think I would try a gel, a, a matte gel. A matte gel? Yeah. Like a, like a, when you say a gel, like a gel yeah. poly? Gen, gen, well, it's a gel urethane gel. That's what I mean, a gel yeah. urethane. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah General um, Finishes has it in it. Does General a really finish. nice matte finish. Dutch Masters makes a wipe on poly that uh, might do the gel. The, the other thing I was wondering about when I was looking at that, or doing that when I was doing, is why can't we use the colored lime wax? You can stain <coughs> the bowl any color you want, or that, mm -hmm. then do your carvings, then use the colored lime wax over the whole thing, and then you take it off with an oil-based finish, like Danish oil or whatever. It gives you two things. It finishes it. You put mm -hmm. two or three coats on there. And you could finish it in a matte finish, or you could finish it in a high gloss. I didn't know if those crevices were too deep for the wax, but I don't think so. Well, so I did. I put the wax on one of those, and well, I, I meant the you that, to kind of work to get that it liming into the... wax I was using for the uh, platter. Yeah, because I was thinking of that while I was thinking of the fact that I was grinding um, those Sturch grindings. I don't know if everybody saw the guy at uh, Sunapee who used a blue. He was using a stain. He had quite a bit. Of, he mixed it with a lot of shellac, so yeah. it was, almost looked like a paint. And then he was coming back with a gold wax. And so all of the, and he was doing it in, in oak or ash. And so that so open, open grain, grain pattern was yeah. there, would accept the gold wax. And so your grain pattern would really pop out as this gold mm. on a blue that was a pretty similar shade of blue to that. Um, so that's a little bit of what you're talking about is to, to put a wax on, a colored wax that would bring out the pattern. Yeah, yeah, that's I think. I don't think you could see the grain on mine. That's mahogany, which is, a, which is an open grain hardwood. Yeah. And, and the, the, the wax picks up that green. Um, I will say, I almost didn't put the blue paint on this one. Because when I put the really thin black and wiped it off, yeah. it already had sort of a coppery look, but a really nice aged, you know, like, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. like an oak barrel, you know, that had been holding whiskey or something, yeah. kind of aged yeah. look to it. Um, and uh, I did do one with the same rim pattern where I painted it with black and then sanded sanded it all off so that just that part was black and it, and it did make it pop out and, and look like it was aged and old. I wonder if mahogany would work the same way with cherry. Would I don't know. Deep, uh, I, deep uh, copper. Um, you could certainly give it a try. <coughs> I, Al just said that you know there's something about the copper and the black that reacts. I don't know if it's some of the tannins or what it is, but hmm. it really does give you a coppery look. And yeah. This is the third one of these I've done. I did two green and one blue. I think the blue one was in the Dartmouth display. Yeah, I remember that one. And um, I sold the other two, um, and, and each time the person would look at it, even after picking it up and, and feeling it and everything, when I told, then they'd say, what's it made out of? And when I told them it was wood, they, they found that hard to believe. Um, so it's just another option for finishes. I, I'd actually like to play with this milk paint some more. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that it'll cover up some imperfections so if I had some muddy cherry or if I had a tiny bit of the red rot that I have in that cherry mm -hmm. it might might hide it um, it might even hide a, a, a repaired crack I'm not sure um, I don't know anybody else use milk paint I have not used it yet I tried it once and didn't no. like it <laughs> didn't like it they they use it to make you know make furniture look old mm -hmm. so like here I, I could easily see that being a, a cupboard or something, leaving your ripple in there, not sanding it <coughs> out, coming back. Mm. Uh, you can also do, there's a way to do a, a crackle technique with it, or a distressed look. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, I'd actually like to build up a couple different colors and sand through them. You know, where we're looking for that tarnished copper. Yeah, no, if you put like the blue you... on top of that and then and then buff through it and see how much green it's or sort how Sort of like Mike's uh, yeah. approach, yeah. Um, now, most of the when they're talking about using it on furniture, they say to do this and then put a second coat on. And the second coat fills the voids and comes out much smoother and then sand that back. Um, so as with any finish, you can get a, a better finish the more coats and the more, yeah. more, 
but um, I was pretty happy with just the way it looks just like that. So I just want to put something on it that will make it more durable without really changing the look of it. Fix it. Just the spray fixative, yeah. Yeah. Yeah.